Imagine growing up your formative years, middle to upper middle class, in a society that appears to have figured it out. Only then, after a matter of months, have the rug of reality pulled out from underneath your culture. And watch this well transfers from the many to the inside knowing few. And worse yet, you are all left with a society whose trust and confidence in one another has been effectively broken. That's essentially what today's first time guest had happened to him in his native nation of Argentina. For the last almost two decades, we've seen the Argentine peso go from one to one parity, with the then much stronger fiat US dollar, to this past week hitting a 60 to one exchange rate, with a fiat US dollar likely worth about half of what it was around the year 2000. In a nation which by appearances was prospering in 1990s, it was an artificial prosperity from a dual fiat currency peg that could not last. By late 2001, the country was suffering from bank runs, account freezings, forced conversion of fiat US dollar accounts at a one-to-one -one parity into Argentine pesos at a three-to-one rate, and then overnight devaluation essentially leading to a loss of over two-thirds of many people's life savings. Oh, you want some of your cash now? Well, if there's any in the ATM, you can only withdraw so many pesos per day, and good luck getting through the daily crowd of protesters banging pots and pants outside of the bank's walls, bulletproof windows, and x-ray doors. Oh, and that sheet metal that surrounds the bank, that's to ward off more graffiti or further structural damage to the bank building's exterior. This week, we speak with a man who lived through that experience, has since immigrated away from the devaluating situ situation there, and is a three-time published author who helps average readers and his YouTube channel viewers to better understand common sense ways to safely survive through severe financial crisis, even while living in a major metropolitan area. But before we get to this week's podcast interview, Let's get an update on this week's precious metals markets closing. Both silver and gold held up well this week in fiat US dollar price action. The spot gold price is closing the week just shy of 1,515 fiat fed notes per derivative troy ounce. Spot silver price is closing right around 1716 per derivative troy ounce in fiat USD. Gold silver ratio is still at 88 and that's still near high levels. The ratio is not seen since the early 1990s. And this is during a week in which the former Federal Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan, made the case publicly for negative interest rates in the United States. One is left to think about potentiality of uh, the cashless policies that will accompany such a drastic change in overall Federal Reserve interest rate policies. This week, we visit with a gentleman again who's authored three books and how to prepare for turbulent times to come. Mr. Fernando Forfal Aguirre joins us after this brief message from our show's sponsor. SD Bullion is a high volume, physical precious metals dealer here in the USA. If you are acquiring an investment grade bullion position, be sure to bookmark www.sdbullion.com forward slash deals, where each and every week we source some of the best bullion deals for our over 100,000 customers worldwide. At the bottom right section of our website, you can also easily subscribe to our weekly bullion deals mailing list, where you will receive weekly notifications of valuable product deals that may be exclusive only to our SD bullion mailing list. Stay tuned to sdbullion.com, the lowest price Period. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap Podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week, we have a new guest to the show. It's Fernando Forfal Aguirre. is the author of three common sense modern survival books. Fernando, I apologize. Kind of stumbled on your last name there. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, it's great to be here talking with you. So, Fernando, I um, just, you know, I found you recently because I had heard the story or the news lately about what's going on with the Argentine peso. It's another explosion of devaluation occurring. And I thought about you uh, this week and was like, you know, I bet I could reach out to him and, and maybe talk to him about what's going on there. Uh, and so we had a little bit of a pre-interview discussion. And I mentioned to you how I had read your 2009 book. Um, I don't want to misquote what it's called. It's a great book. Let me pull up the name real fast. 
uh, Modern Survival Manual, Surviving the Economic Collapse, and it's based on the firsthand experience of the 2001 economic collapse in Argentina. Um, I read that book in 2010, and uh, first of all, I love the cover of the book. I think it's awesome. <laughs> and you told me that you, you designed that thing yourself, which I thought was sweet. Uh, and then B, I just thought it was great the way you spoke in it, you know, the voice you used, the tonality of it was very common sense. Um, and that's been a really good selling book for almost 10 years now. And, uh, but, but recently you came out with a new book, Street Survival Skills. Um, maybe give us a little bit of a synopsis. Uh, not necessarily so much about the books just yet. We'll talk about that maybe a little later. But just in general, who you are, Fernando, who, where you come from. You know, give people a little bit of an idea. Right. Well, I was born in Argentina, lived there my entire life. But I was uh, fortunate enough uh, to travel quite a bit. Uh, also lived in the United States, uh, so I had um, a good bit of uh, experience about what the world is about, like we were talking about before. And basically growing up, uh, your typical middle class, maybe even upper middle class in Buenos Aires, so a, a good life. And all of a sudden, man, we, we saw things uh, go downhill pretty fast, and that was the 2001 uh, economic collapse, which uh, I had always had an interest in survival, uh, more of the wilderness type of thing. Also, I've always been into uh, farms as well mm -hmm. from a very early age. Uh, that's been a, a hobby of mine. But I soon realized that many of the things I, I thought were related to survival and preparedness really didn't apply to what was happening there. The thing is that the country went to um, a, a serious economic problem when they defaulted on the national debt, basically $132 billion worth of it. They just, I mean, the, the country just ran out of uh, money it it had been going on for a long time on a one-to-one -one exchange rate with the peso and the US dollar which was not realistic ruined the local economy unemployment went through the roof and then it just f fell apart pretty fast mm -hmm. so, so I, I go ahead yeah go ahead that, that was the point where uh, I started looking into how is it that you prepare for that and I realized that a lot of the stuff available uh, regarding survival and preparedness was not very realistic and didn't work for that sort of situation so that's where I started writing myself I ended up with my first book yeah so so for people that don't understand Buenos Aires Argentina I've I, I was firsthand I had the experience of actually living there 2003 to 2004 for about six or seven months and we had ha talked about this a little bit in the pre-interview um, you know, the, the reason why I went down there was kind of twofold. I had graduated from school. I lived in Costa Rica for a bit and I wanted to see another side of Latin America and the southern area of South America is a lot different from Central America. And so getting down there, the dialect in Spanish is totally different. I mean, it's it's very different from Central America. And, and I enjoyed my time there. But to, so people understand that Buenos Aires is a metropolis. It's a massive city. It's it's along the lines of like a Chicago sized city. It's, it's like 12 million people that live in the city. And so to have a situation where you have an ec economy, all of a sudden one peso is worth one dollar for a decade. Everyone gets used to that, you know, for a decade. Imagine how good everyone was feeling. But behind the scenes, they had this this issue uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the deficit just kept building and building. And Argentina is not like the United States, it doesn't have the financial plumbing of the world still still at it. And so when, when there's a break like that, all of a sudden there's a quick break and it happened very fast. And the valuation went from one to one for, to one to three, eventually one to four almost. Uh, so you had a situation where people, people had dollars in their bank in Buenos Aires and the, the banks went in and said, now you have pesos. Suck on that. And there goes about 70% of your wealth right away. Just boom. Overnight because they did that. I mean, people were going crazy. When I was there in 2003, they were still outside at, at lunch banging pots and pans against the banks for years later uh, because, you know, their entire savings have been squandered uh, based on this policy. And so I don't think people really understand the veracity of what that is like when you see it firsthand. So I just wanted to give you, a, you know, at least our, our listeners an account of what that's like. Yes, it's quite terrible, especially if you think of, you know, think of yourself, whatever it is that you work for your entire life, saving money, you think you're going, you're doing great, you had a, you have a hundred thousand bucks, two hundred thousand bucks, whatever it is, and all of a sudden, they no, you now have this little monopoly money that's not worth anything, and we're going to be keeping your, your, your actual dollars, we're going to be keeping those, and, and basically that's going to be it, mm -hmm. and you'll just lose your mind, yeah, you'll you're... just not like that, and the, the banks that did, this is something that people don't quite understand, the banks that did that, are the same banks you have anywhere else. They are the exact same banks. It's not some evil 
shady Latin American country <laughs> bank. It, it is the same banks that you know from all over the world, the exact same ones. Right, right. So they're not – they have no problem in doing that sort of thing if they can get away with it. If right. they can get away with it, they will do it. So you're talking like the names like Citibank, right? I know that they were down all there. Right. Every, yeah, every major them. multinational bank that was down there did it. And those are like – you know, when I was there, I, I people didn't look at me like they would use the word janky, right? Vosso janky, right? <laughs> yeah. And and I could feel the 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 disdain that was on that word because you could feel the disdain for the janky because they were the bank scum who came down here and ruined our uh, culture. <laughs> essentially, that's essentially the that would be the sentiment that I would feel sometimes from it, right? Yeah, well, it depends on 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 the group of people you're in. Right. In general, I I wouldn't say personally, I never had any 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 such such feelings mm -hmm. of course and most of the of the people i hang with uh, but of course there's the the, the mistrust so the, these are bankers that are wall street bankers mm -hmm. basically and they just set up their branch here they took our money and now they're telling us we're not giving it back yeah. to you yeah so that that yeah. upsets people sure. uh, they i would say that it was against bankers in general yeah you know any banker it, yeah. it was like you know, the, the guy that you knew your entire life from your bank branch, your local branch in, in your neighborhood, that guy lied to your face. I mean, it happened to my my mother-in-law. She went with my wife to the bank and, and she was, my daughter is telling me that things are, are complicated and maybe there's going to be problems. Should we take the money out today? And this woman, she knew her her entire life. Nah, that's, don't worry. Yeah. It's all fine. Right. Knowing that that same day they would be closing the doors and would not be opening, it's 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 what people do. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. In a situation, yeah, when they're following orders and they can turn around and it's just like the you know I guess Nazi war time. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just following orders. Okay. Well, that's not yeah. going to work in the Hague. <laughs> um, so all right, let's get back on track. I just wanted to understand. You know, we we were sitting at one to one peso to dollar, and now yes. it's. It's blown out this past week. What what happened this past week in Argentina? Well, the thing is that it was, as you said, we we ended up in one dot. We went from one to one dollar exchange rate to one to three all of a sudden. That has a direct impact on the economy. All of a sudden, you go to the supermarket and everything has gone up in price, uh, like so, just following a track of what money is really worth. So. Uh, that sent uh, inflation through the roof. And since then, Argentina has been struggling with inflation every single year, 25, 30, 40 percent each year. Uh, right now, it's it was up until recently, it was one dollar forty five pesos, give or take. All of a sudden, from this uh, past uh, Sunday, it, it jumped to 62, 63. And that's about where it is right now. And this happened because there's been elections, the primary elections for the next president. The, the next presidential ones, where the current president, Mauricio Macri, which is more of a market-friendly, right-leaning type of guy, friends with Trump, he's like a, a business type of, you know, of president, someone mm -hmm. more of a, what you would expect from a developed country. Now this guy is losing, and ahead 15 points is Cristina, no one else but Cristina Kirchner, the one that was in charge of the huge mess that was a country for 12 years along with her husband she's winning by 15 points mm -hmm. a woman that has she, she's been trialed time and again they're looking for money I literally digged in her property in containers full of money that's the kind of prime we're talking about and that's a woman that's supposed to be the next president of the country yeah i had stepped away from watching the news so much about argentina because it breaks my heart every time i go and look at that stuff it's sad. It, you know it gets real sad and i, I from the periphery it looked like she was finally going to get her comeuppance and she was going to end up in jail or at least get yeah. kicked out of power. But to see her somehow making a comeback is uh, is very it's interesting. Amazing. Yeah, you, she must have sway over a big population of idiots, I guess, who think that it's OK to have corruption at that level. But, uh, hey, you know, she has I, money. She has a lot. I would the imagine rumor is that yeah. the rumor is that the, she stole an entire uh, PBI of the country, <laughs> which would not be. Would not be crazy given that they were in power for 12 years. So right. if, if they stole like 10% each year, it's not out of the yeah. question. So right. you're talking about you're talking about money in pretty much every country that you can think of besides ridiculous amount of cash buried. Right. There, there were times in which all of a sudden in the in the city and in Buenos Aires, all of a sudden 
the money that was floating around the, the currency, she, she liked euros, the euro, the the European currency. Mm -hmm. She liked the 500 euro bill. She oh, liked God. those a lot. Yeah, and well, any, sudden, anybody who likes to launder money likes a 500 euro bill. Sure. Yeah. All of a sudden, in the city, there would be money, dollars, euros, but uh, like with humidity, like, as if it had been buried. You could actually smell that. Oh. That was the money that was floating around in the city. God. And <laughs> the tale goes that that's that's her. That's her money. Yeah. Well, I, kind of money so let's get into detail so listeners understand. Now, since the peso has been devaluing since the last 20 odd years, you know, uh, you have a situation where there's I remember when I was there in 2003, there was money exchanges everywhere because people I would imagine when they save money, they get their pesos and they want to go and exchange them for f physical dollars and euros. You know, so you have multiple currencies kind of flowing in this in this economy. But in those exchanges, there's huge amounts of money being made in terms of percentage exchanges. Right. When you go to change Argentine pesos to physical euros or to physical dollars, you're paying huge spreads. And in those spreads, yeah. I'm certain that the black market is involved and that Kitchener's or whoever's, whoever else wants to make a good cut is going to get their cut or you're not allowed to operate your, your exchange. You know? So that's, a, I would imagine, a place where they make a lot of money in those big exchanges. Well, for years, the, the most money she did was as president, she would have two types of exchange rates. She would have the official one yeah. and the so-called illegal one sure. that was the real one. Sure. So she would... what. Her, herself and her, you know, the people that work for her would just import, export at, at the official rate. But at the end of the day, the money that moved around the country was in this, uh, in, in the real economy. Right. So she would make. She would arbitrage between arbitrage between the fake exchange rate and the real yeah. black market exchange rate, which is the true yeah. exchange rate the on the street. The black market was a real market. Right. How much? The money was – this is very similar to Venezuela where, right. where if you ask Maduro, he's yeah. going to be telling you one Bolivar is right, right. Uh, like $10 right. and then it's actually 30 million Bolivar is right. because it, it's nothing. Right. So, Miami Herald did a recent – like two years ago an article about the uh, illegal exchange rate in Venezuela and how much money Maduro and his cronies were making out of this fake exchange rate versus the black market exchange rate. And it was tremendous money, billions of dollars. Every year. It's obscene. Right. And yeah. so Argentina's probably been doing that for decade plus. And so uh, that, that makes total sense that they would make that much money. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I, I get why she still somehow has sway in power. And That's why she has back. so much power because yeah. she has a, an incredible amount of money. Yeah. And you, you see it. You see how she buys yeah. networks. She buys, she buys people, of course, judges. Yeah. She buys everything because right. she has crazy crazy money. amount of money okay all right so now that we have a, a hold on the politics and kind of what's really running the the, the real politique of argentina um maybe we can swing it toward um you know obviously she's coming back into power and you know the exchange the currency markets don't like to see that and they exploded out so just imagine like you know just on the street level on, on like a middle class just barely, you know, Argentine. How do they operate in this kind of situation in the last decade or two? At least the ones that decided to stay there. You know, how are they? How do they yeah. get by? How does it work day to day? It's well, of course, it, it's it's extremely difficult, and uh, it pains me as you know, as, as it is my country. And you see, you've seen people struggle a lot. So for the last four years, with last three and a half years with with Macri, they, they, the struggle has been putting the country back in some kind of order. And for that, you need to rebuild the infrastructure that has been completely destroyed, gr gain credibility. That's that's key because we talk about economy all the time. People forget that it's, this is all about feeling. This is all about trust. If I don't trust you, I don't, tr I don't trust your money, we're not going to be doing any kind of business. If I don't trust you as a person, we're, we, ha we really have nothing to talk about. The rest of the world does not trust this woman. They started trusting Macri and started trusting Argentina a little bit. They had the G20 over there. Every leader around the globe that was respectable went there and did, you know, they bet on Argentina that it was going to be getting back on track. And, and that was slowly, very slowly, very painfully getting back on track. But it's still inflation was hit, was hitting people very hard. And since this lie of the of the official and unofficial exchange rate was over, uh, a, a lot of people struggled with, with poverty. Poverty somewhat kept the same as she had left it. At the same time, Macri was building the infrastructure so as to have business come over. Uh, the, 
so as to build a real country for mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. uh, he was hit pretty hard by the exchange rate with uh, the main product of Argentina, which is agriculture. Mm -hmm. So yeah, soybean was not selling very well, which right. is the Argentine yeah. gold, let's put it some way. Right. So the economy was not helping out. He has a, a pretty bad year in terms of crops as well. Uh, that was not ideal. Uh, and mm -hmm. he had to make uh, changes just to make the country viable. Mm -hmm. uh, for years in Argentina, for example, electricity was, was free. You, you just paid, you know, 10 cents worth of your electric bill. Uh, at the same time, you, they were buying boats full of natural gas from Bolivia or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. um, he finally said, okay, we have to pay bills like civilized countries. It's going to be 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. People didn't like that. Yeah. They liked the free money that yeah. in theory was free, but at the end of the day was being taken away from them, from our from our our means paying more than before but people don't understand these things at that level they yeah. just feel that they, they don't they don't longer have free fuel or whatever mm -hmm. uh, they've been surviving as argentina has always been surviving especially these last 20 years barely so and right now people are a little bit desperate and i recently did a video about this people are running to the supermarket stocking up they're buying everything they can uh it's they, they say the, the sale of uh, primary you know, staples went up 40% yesterday, just just now, and they're buying any U.S. dollar, anything that they can have so as to save anything of their savings left as inflation is going to be hitting them unavoidably because it's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. It's going to be happening mm -hmm. uh, and getting prepared as best as they can. Mm -hmm. I suppose people who live in that situation, then they have to turn around and if they make a salary, they have to sit there and negotiate with their managers. And I've heard a lot of times in these situations, that's one of the hardest positions to be in is a, is a managerial position because you constantly have to talk to your employees about the cost of living and they constantly need to get raises. And it's just this back and forth, back and forth that oxidizes and makes the situation more corrosive and the relationships more troubling, I would imagine. You've been to Argentina. You know what it's, what it's like. Everyone, every, everyone is very smart in Argentina. Everyone is trying to take advantage of out of everyone because that's the way life works over there. Yeah. So you're always negotiating. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. you're having a cup of coffee with a friend, and you're always trying to see how you can. Is he trying to screw me over? Is he, <laughs> that, that's how you live. Jesus. All yeah, the time. yeah, that, you, that's you're tough. You're laughing because you know. Well, I'm that like, yeah, I know because, but it's just rough because that that like we talk about the the trust level and the corrosion of trust. And you're constantly paranoid that someone's trying to get over on you some way or in some fashion or another. And it's got to be very, very difficult. It's difficult to be, in a, be an employee, be an employer as well. Because, for example, what I was just mentioning about uh, electricity. Macri came, he came and said, yeah, we cannot have free electricity for someone in a private club heating a swimming pool yeah, at 10 sense. cents a, yeah. a month when yeah. people are freezing to death paying $10 for a bottle of, of bottle gas. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. That's crazy and that's <laughs> that's lunacy. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that anymore. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you're going to be charging us for, for gas, for electricity? What are you talking about? Are you you're crazy talking? <laughs> At the same time, companies were also taking advantage of that because there were many companies that were taking advantage of the state finance free electricity. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Macri, Macri comes and says, yeah, you have to pay what electricity is worth because if not, we cannot have a realistic uh, grid in the country. And many companies went bankrupt when they had to pay for the first time in decades yeah. real yeah. Uh, bills. Their business know? model was built on free electricity. Their business model was based on uh, a uh, subsidized an electric, bill, yeah. an electric bill worth a, a cup of coffee <laughs> i'm not joking literally a cup of coffee oh, God. Uh, and you you explain to people that's not real that's not how the world works anywhere <laughs> you cannot have that right yeah yeah so uh, so essentially when you start screwing around with the market like that with all these subsidizations and they change so quickly the volatility of the economy and, and the, the change it must be very sudden uh, and it makes it tumultuous if you're if you're constantly having these ins and outs with different policies all of a sudden maybe someone cannot pay his his power bill his yeah. gas bill all of a sudden uh, a company closes because of these same reasons that we're mm -hmm. saying all of a sudden he's fired he's out of a job yeah. he has to go look for something else uh, all of this is what is what Macri was trying to put it, it finally in order. Mm -hmm. But you cannot do that in a, in a few years. You cannot do that in, in, even in four years. You're going to be needing, and worse than that even, because that's titanic, but even worse is changing the mindset of people yeah. so as to understand uh, this is how real countries work. Yeah. You want to be a real country, you have to make these changes. 
and it's hard. And yeah. they were halfway there, and now they're about to turn the boat around and go back Wrong to way. the madness. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy yeah. talk. Right, right. So I, in 2003, seeing this, 2004, it really gave me a sense, you know, looking at the United States and our deficit situation, and, and it gave me a lot of concern about the future for our country. I mean, Argentina, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, was a beacon in the South America in terms of wealth and, and in culture and music. And I mean, it was, it was the creme de la creme. Buenos Aires was essentially Paris of that side of the world. And to see it, what it's become, uh, it, made, it made me worry a lot about uh, the United States. And it's a lot different of economy. The United States obviously has the financial engineering. It has the U.S. dollar reserve currency. So it's more of a Titanic than, say, uh, you know, Argentina. But I do yeah, see in slower motion the corrosion of a lot of the, the trust. Ever since 2008, um, I see a lot of things, you know, a lot of similarities uh, in a slower uh, process uh, and a more complex process in the United States than perhaps in a country like Argentina. But I still see that same trend. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're probably seeing that and not just in the United States, probably elsewhere, too. It's as you say, it's a, it's a different country. Of course, you're not going to be comparing Argentina to the United States. But it's in, in many ways, it's always about trust. So even if you're talking about a juggernaut of a country, uh, a titan of a country, once people realize that they're being screwed over, so as to put it in, mm -hmm. in, in layman terms, it, once that trust is lost, once everyone says, okay, give me whatever it is that I have in the bank, I'm gonna be buying, <laughs> I'm gonna be buying something real because this is not gonna be working. Mm -hmm. what, it, no, first of all, no country can survive a bank run. Once yeah. everyone goes to the bank at the same time, wants cash, and, and they all say cash only because this is it, I just want that, that piece of paper that's not worth anything, but at least give me that, yeah, no it's a problem. Survive. Yeah, when, once people start asking, everyone starts asking for their money back and trust is lost, that's a real problem, yes. right? Once trust is lost, it's the end of it, no matter how big you are. Yeah. Because this is all about trust. Once yeah. you don't have it, you're sure. done. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I guess my, my concern in 2003 after seeing this was that it's happening in slower motion here in the United States. And, and, and the, theoretically in the Western world, it's happened ever since, really, in a slow motion. But yeah. it's starting to speed up a bit, it feels. Uh, it feels like in this coming decade, we're going to have to come to fruition and maybe have some structural changes in the Western world and the way that we operate. Just, uh, and it makes sense politically, just given the demographics that this is coming. Uh, but even in the pre-interview, when we discussed just the demographics of the situation, how people in the Western world aren't having as many children, um, you know, how this immigration is, you have people funneling in from Africa into Europe, you have people coming in from the Middle East into Europe, and then the United States, you have people in Central America flooding the United States. Um, so these are all these are all just in symptoms of ultimately what we're dealing with here is a world with too much debt, too many promises it can't make and can't keep, and us not coming to the realization that this is this is the reality that we're going to have to deal with, and and how do you do that in a firsthand experience? I mean, you you write books about different survival skills. Uh, let's let's perhaps go into a little bit of uh, some of your writing, uh, the street survival skills book that you come out with. You know, I read your 2009 book, very impressed. Definitely going to read this new one. I want to hear a little bit about uh, what you've been what you've been writing in this new one and how, how how you know what kind of stuff you have to say. This one is is very strongly linked to my first one because I go straight into the actual skills of what you actually need for getting through these kind of things. Uh, I, I'm very proud of this last one because I, I uh, my second book was also interesting in terms of you know relocating, finding places. But this is more about the skills that I describe in the first one explained with lots of sketches, graphics, and drawings, which, which is uh, one of the other things I enjoy doing very much. And, but explain, a, a lot of it is it's about defending, about self-defense, mm -hmm. uh, awareness, about uh, staying out of trouble, you know, mm -hmm. avoiding problems in the first place. Uh, of course, when those problems cannot be avoided, we talk about things about self-defense. But uh, a lot of the book is, you know, stay alert, know what's going on, know what's going on even politically. I, I wrote a little bit of, about that. We, which we talked about before, how you're constantly being lied on mm -hmm. through the through the internet. We think that we're more, we think that we're smarter than ever. And real, realistically, we're being lied to more than ever before. Mm -hmm. We're being manipulated more than ever before through these algorithms that, that know our, uh, us better than we know ourselves. Literally, they're saying that they have 5,000 uh, points about each one of us, 5,000 identi uh, identifying characteristics of each one of us. Mm -hmm. If, if I gave you a piece of paper, you couldn't even write a hundred. 
<laughs> so they literally know us better than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the best ways in which they manage us. They send you news that makes you angry, that makes you happy mm -hmm. at different stages. It's, uh, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, going back to what you were asking, it's, this book is, is basically about skills. Even, for example, is uh, how to identify precious metals. Is this real silver that I'm being given or not? How can I tell? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. identifying uh, uh, bills even, money, you know, paper money, is this um, counterfeit bills or not? Mm -hmm. it's, these are all things that as the situation progresses, if you ever find yourself actually trading with precious metals, it's important for you to know what is real and what is not. Because if not, you're going to be handed a, a pile of metal that is, that is not <laughs> silver, it's not gold, and you're not going to be liking it one bit. So it sounds to me like, Fernando, you, know, you, you wrote a new updated book about if you are in a big city and you know, there's a big problem uh, economically, financially, in your, in your part of the world, and you're not going to be running off to the countryside and you're going to be staying in your city because you really, you know, you live there and that's where your family is. And, you know, I don't live in the woods. Uh, I'm not going to the woods. Uh, I'm going to stay in my yeah. city and hunker down. So this is a common sense guide to kind of how you do that in a safe and practical manner. Yes, even if you are living in the in the country, you I mean, if you live in the country, you're going to be driving a lot. Yeah. And th there's yep. several chapters I have on defensive driving yep. and how to handle a, an ambush. And I know some some of the crazier stuff in that book is actual stuff that happened and happened either to myself or some friends of mine. So whenever people read in that book some strategy that seems completely crazy, know that someone actually did that and it worked for them. Okay. And one of those is specifically about handling an ambush and some of the possibilities. So as to follow that, so even if you're living in the country, it, they will go after you in the country as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So Once crime gets out of control, they will go after everyone. Right. No one is really safe. Right. So I mean, we're talking about we're talking about situations in in countries where things go so bad that gangs start kidnapping rich people and then extorting yeah. rich people for, for for money. And if you don't think that's rich yeah, or middle class, or middle class, middle class right? Yeah. They'll do whatever it takes. So you could be in a situation where uh, that starts happening commonly in a first world country. And how do you avoid that situation? How do you plan around that situation? If that's I, you know, not saying that I, that's what I'm hoping for, but you have to start thinking in those terms if you are concerned. Look, when when this happened in Argentina in 2000, before 2001, and I'm talking about a couple months before December 2001, if you heard kidnappings, it was well, that, that happened in Colombia, right? You yeah. know, but Colombia, Central America, some some shady place <laughs> in Argentina. No one gets kidnapped in Argentina. All of a sudden, yes, you got kidnapped in Argentina, mm -hmm. all right. And it wasn't just super rich people. It was. Hey, that kid has a private school uniform. Let's kidnap that kid because that kid is paying 500 bucks a month right. because that school uniform is from a from a fancy, expensive school uniform. Mm -hmm. That could easily happen. I I have my doubts if it's not happening already in, in some parts of, of places where people would be surprised. Mm -hmm. They see a school uniform from a private school. That kid is paying 1000 bucks. We snatch that kid. Mm -hmm. We call the parent through his own cell phone. Hey, 1000 bucks right now. 2000 10 whatever right. if, if not you're not seeing your kid it's an ex sure. uh, a, what's called an express kidnapping right. it's one of the fastest ways for criminals to make money right right so you're talking about in a situation where extortion becomes a common business practice to make quick money uh, and how you kind of have to plan around that in a city where perhaps that starts becoming more common um, these are types of things in your book that you'll talk about I would imagine yes correct yeah. and the, the drawings you did all the drawings yourself yeah. Wow, you're pretty gifted, <laughs> man. A bit wacky, I guess, but. <laughs> oh, that's that's not easy to do. That that's probably I, that's uh, you're obviously very good at design because I I think your original cover you might not think is great. I think it's visceral, and I I'm, my guess is that uh, this next book probably has some great designs I, too. I taught in the University of Buenos Aires. I taught archi architectural representation, which is sketching and graphics oh, wow. and that sort of thing. Okay. So uh, I kind of have a grasp. You know, they're not they're not works of art, but the, <laughs> the point is it gets the work the it gets the message across of what I'm trying to represent. Yeah. I think that is achieved there. Yes. Well, great. I mean, that's uh, in the end, that's the point is getting across. That's why I loved your first book so much, was because the tonality was essentially, you know, here's here's the rub of it. Here's what I think. And this is what I'm going to say. And, and, you know, this is my common sense. And uh, to read that is always, I find, enlightening and fun. And so my hunch is this next book will be the same. It's out on Amazon already. It's already out on Amazon this just a couple of days ago, they still need like a week so as to start the promotion and things mm. that Amazon does sure. on their own thing. Sure. But it's, it's already up there if people want to go check it out. Yeah. 
Great. So I'll backlink that in the show notes for people if they want to go find that new book and even the old book. Uh, I'm sure they could get it, you know, uh, through Amazon, both of them. Uh, Fernando, I definitely would like to have you back at some point in the future if you'd be willing. Uh, maybe a, a, is there anything you want to tell our audience as we uh, as we walk out of this first uh, discussion? Well, anytime you want, just let me know and we'll we'll do this again because it's fantastic talking with you and just to you know, enjoy things, enjoy life as it is. Try not to worry too much, but yeah. just prepare a little bit so as to take it easy and, and not worry about things you could potentially prepare for and be ready. Nice. Okay, great. Fernando, thank you so much for those pearls of wisdom and look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Thanks.